The long-awaited Android-powered G2, the successor to the now ancient G1, has finally been announced, first of all for T-Mobile in the USA, equipped with a Z-Fold slide-out QWERTY keyboard reminiscent of the Nokia N97, but without the tilt. The G2 has a 3.7-inch screen, Android 2.2 free out, of course, 3.5 mil output, plus all the usual top-end 2010 specs, including HD video recording, 800MHz processor, 4GB of internal flash memory, and an 8GB memory card pre-installed. Continuing the 2 theme, the Milestone 2, hinted at in a previous show, is now a reality with the same specs and form factor but with 720p video recording now enabled, though if it's anything like the HTC Desire's retrofitted 720p recording see later in this show, I wouldn't expect too much. Also from Motorola but brand new is the ruggedized Defy, yet another 3.7 inch Gorilla Glass screened Android handset, but dust, scratch, impact and water resistant. Apparently it can resist being submersed in a metre of water for up to half an hour. Impressive. I find myself at the verge of a new era for the phone show. As you'll have seen if you've been watching this via the YouTube channel, I've taken the plunge and have started filming everything in full 720p. That's 1280 by 720 pixels per frame. Aside from the problem that you've now got to stare at the imperfections in my face and bodily hair, there's the issue of what I film the phone show on. For the last four years I've been championing the video potential of smartphones by shooting the entire show on phones, so I definitely wanted to keep up that tradition, if only because I'm well bloody minded. But which phone to choose? I've tried a number of phones that shoot in 720p over the last six months, and I've had samples sent to me from the couple of phones I've yet to try, in an effort to try and judge them all on five things, video quality, smoothness, focusing concerns, audio capture quality, and file compatibility with desktop video editing software. Having reviewed all the clips and assessed all the video characteristics, I then graded and sorted the 720p capable phones. Rejected at the first pass are the Samsung i910 HD that I'm I rather ironically shooting this clip on, <laughs> albeit with a little digital audio post-production magic. The raw audio is just not good enough. I'll leave the post-production off for the E5 review later on in this show, and you can see what I mean. Also rejected with a Motorola XT720, the footage is appallingly focused, i.e. well not at all really. The quality at every turn is bad and the files it produces need transcoding before they can be used elsewhere. Uh, also rejected the HTC Desire which acquired 720p video capture as part of its Android 2.2 upgrade. The videos are just appalling though, have a look, with hopeless clarity and lack of any kind of focus. But on to my top five. Remember, this is just of smartphones available to us in the UK. I appreciate that a few US only models also shoot 720p now. All five of these in my top five would be good enough, I suspect, for filming the entire phone show, but I want to rank them anyway, as there are differences that are worth noting. At number five, the Samsung Wave, taking incredibly vibrant videos with a preset focus and good depth of field, but spoilt by very quiet audio capture, and to be honest, the fact that the phone runs BADA, which is still rather immature for everyday use. Good value though, and the cheapest of all the options here. At number four, Samsung again with the Galaxy S, producing great picture quality and depth of field again, but again the audio quality lets it down slightly in this exalted company. At number three, the Sony Ericsson Vivaz, with Pretty quiet audio again, but brought up a notch by being unique in having continuous autofocus. So as a jack-of-all-trades camcorder in your pocket, it'll cope with everything from landscapes to ladybirds on leaves, all in one shot without you having to lift a finger. At number two, the Apple iPhone 4, a superlative video capture tool, uh, both for close-up subjects and general use. Uh, colours are good, frame rate is silky smooth and audio is great too. Focusing is done by tapping spots manually on the display, which can be a slight pain if there are changing subjects in the shot, as is common with home movies. Excellent overall though. But at number one, you probably guessed at this device by now, the Nokia N8, which I've played with several times now and for which I've examined quite a bit of footage. Look out for a full hands-on review in the next phone show, but in the meantime, it's number one for video capture because of the huge depth of field, I mean, you never need to even think about focusing for excellent audio capture, which is right up with that of the digital microphone of the N86 I've been using for the last year or so. Um, plus, intelligent three times digital zoom, so you don't lose any quality when zooming in, amazing. Uh, plus good low light capture performance. The only downside of the N8 for video is you can't shoot anything really close up, um, but I can live with that. A great top five, I think. What's not to like? Take the best bits of the Nokia E71, the rock solid build quality, battery cover retention, and large spacebar, 
take the best bits, the budget, E63, the LED torch mode, the prize, Nokia podcasting and internet radio, take the best bits of the E72, the 5 megapixel camera, the use of S60 3rd edition feature pack 2, plus a truckload of modern widgets and clients, and then put everything together in the mix and release it all in a single product, the E5, that's cheaper than all three, at least when comparing launch prices. Sound too good to be true? It is. You see, there's one huge overwhelming compromise made in the E5, and I'm not even sure Nokia realizes the problems it causes. In their other low-end smartphones recently, and fueled perhaps by the fact that these things are designed in Finland, where it's basically night, for six months at a time, Nokia has foregone its usual transflective displays used in almost all their non-touch phones since the year dot in favour of cheap and nasty transmissive only displays like this one. They look the same indoors but fade into nothingness when you take them outdoors into the sunlight, which naturally enough is where you actually want to be using your phone half the time. It's a crippling compromise to be honest and a great shame. There are other compromises in the E5 but they have far less impact. The battery is only 1200 milliamp hours because of space restrictions due to the new trendy curved back. Uh, but it's no matter, you'll still get three days of normal use out of this thing per charge. The cameras eat off that extended depth of field rather than auto focusing, but I think this actually suits the target market better. More photos will come out well more of the time. And this is a video test on the E5 in uh, late September sunshine here in the UK. VGA resolution, 15 frames a second, no focusing of any kind. Also a rather quiet audio soundtrack with noise cancellation, which may annoy. And the micro SD card is tucked away under the battery, so you can't hot swap it. Not really something many E5 buyers will want to do often, and all this way around there's one less hatch to have on the outside to let in dust, and the case can be stronger. Elsewhere, you'll be very familiar with the software and form factor, of course. All the usual S60 stars are here in force, including Ovi Maps, the editing version of Quick Office, the new 2010 contacts-based home screen seen here, plus the aforementioned internet radio and podcasting. Add in clients and widgets for Facebook, Associated Press, Bloomberg, and a dozen others, and you can see that the E5 is actually a lot of smartphone in a very small and very tough package. Two other brief hardware notes. I love the speaker on the E5. It may be on the back and muffled a little when you put the phone on the soft surface. But it's so loud and of such high quality. When you start the E5 up and hear those tones, you'll jump in your seat. On the other hand, Nokia have messed up the volume keys, uh, which on my review unit were far too hard to press in. Fail. Whether you want or need a small 2.4 inch screen smartphone in 2010 is a personal decision, of course. The form factor is definitely cute, but even I'll admit that half the things I now want to do on a smartphone really need a bigger display. However, anyone whose life centres around messaging and email and who simply needs something, a small, tough, with a QWERTY keyboard which is not going to run out of juice, for them the E5 should be ideal. And won't break the bank by the way, it's already under £200 SIM free here in the UK. Just stay out of the sun though, okay? Stay out of the sun. This is the Nokia E5.